want you to open your Bibles tonight. I'm going to get right into the Word. And tonight, I'm going to digress. Oh, you don't want to miss Sunday. You don't want to miss. I am going to be declaring the prophetic word for 2018. And it's a good one. It's a good one. It's a good one. And I, I know that, you know, I, I really expect God is going to speak to me even a, a lot more over the next few days. I'm going to be uh, heading on up to uh, the One Thing Conference tomorrow morning, and then I'm flying back early Sunday morning. Yes, 6 a.m. flight, get back about 8 a.m., and then get in here and preach. So I'll be all tanked up or tired, one of the two. I mean, Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Let's begin with Acts chapter 2 and beginning with verse 1. And I want to talk about today, I actually started a very theological book, and it is a scholarly, scholarly, crazy scholarly book, and it's all on miracles. Um, it's a, a, by a, a, a professor by the name of Craig Keener, and he goes through and makes the scholarly, even for the secular, proof that Jesus' life was filled with miracles. In fact, it's a very interesting distinction because back then during the, uh, in the day, it's not that different groups that believed in different religions didn't believe in the supernatural, but almost exclusively, except very rare occasions, they would have to go to a particular place, a, a particular temple or whatever, to try to receive their miracle. And most often, they would actually go to that temple. They would sleep very, very often, the more famous ones. They would sleep there overnight, hope they got some kind of dream, and then when they woke up, somehow they were better. And, uh, and there's, you know, some testimony or, you know, they, they, they make their cases and stuff on this. But nothing to the mention of what was seen in Jesus' life. And what was also unusual is it was extremely unusual to have a person who was a miracle worker. They had places that they believed for the supernatural, but, and you know, you think back in ancient times, oh, they all believed in the supernatural, but they had places to believe for it that were places of healing. Often they were also associated with places that had, like, what they would call healing waters or natural springs or, you know, you know, sulfur springs and those kind of things. Uh, often they were kind of associated together with them. But to see an individual who walked with miracles was actually extraordinarily unlikely. And nobody had ever seen the miracles that Christ saw. In fact, until Jesus came, there had never been a case of blind eyes being opened. Now, when you go through history and you start looking through history, even the secular history and the, and the historical documents of the day, there is absolutely no refuting that Jesus walked in tremendous, that were tremendous miracles that were associated with his life. Even the most hardened skeptics have to admit that there were that, those things which were attributed as miracles tremendously through his life. And as a fact, to the extent that they said you cannot separate his teaching from his miracle ministry. I'm going to say that again. You cannot separate Jesus' teaching from his miracle ministry. In fact, we're going to go to Acts in a moment. Let's go over to, let's, uh, go over to um, Luke chapter 4, verse 18. And then throw that up there when you get it. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. And I want to lay a few foundations here because it's amazing when we start looking at the life of Christ and then we begin to understand. Uh, can you do the New King James Version? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. When we look at the life of Christ and begin to compare it to how we do church today, there's a big disparity. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to... Heal, everybody say heal, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captors, recovery of sight to the blind, and it set at, li set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, Mark chapter 16, verse 17. Let's start with there. Mark chapter 16, verse 17. When Jesus gave the great commission to the disciples. Because not only was the distinctiveness that Christ himself was a miracle worker throughout history, but there was also another very great distinctiveness. His followers, his disciples, his ones that he discipled, also were known through secular history as workers of miracles. That you could not separate the preaching of the gospel from the working of miracles in the ministry of Paul. 
You could not separate it in the ministry of Peter. You could not separate it in the ministry of all the other uh, apostles. You could not separate the working of miracles from the preaching of the gospel. They always accompany it. Let's look at this. Mark chapter 16, verse 17. And these signs will follow those who believe. Anybody here believe? Okay, I'm a believer. All right. These signs will follow in my name. They will now, the, the, the two areas of miracles they said were the most pronounced in Christ and the early church's life was the healing of the sick and the casting out of demons. They were the two main, there was other supernatural miracles that would happen at different times and seasons, but the two predominant manifestations that happened consistently was the healing of the sick and the casting out of devils. Put that in, put that in your heart, it's very important. And they will cast out devils. Turn to your neighbor and say, you will cast out devils. All right. At Christmas dinner. Come out. Okay. I hope you all had a good Christmas, by the way. Yeah, we had, we had a great Christmas. Uh, they will speak with. Oop, there it is. They will speak with new tongues. says it right there. To those who believe, they will speak with new. So that's why I have no problem with tongues. That's why I believe everybody can speak in tongues. I know a lot of people, we try. The reason we, and I don't want to be negative. I don't want to make anybody feel bad. But I believe the number one reason people don't speak in tongues is because they don't believe it. They don't really believe it. They kind of, I kind of hope maybe possible. But they don't really believe it. In fact, I like what Kenneth Hagin said. He said there's two reasons when people don't receive of the, of the moving of the Holy Spirit and the working of the Holy Spirit. It's one of two things. Either they have not believed it. What was the other word? Ah, uh, there it is. Thank you. My brain, I was thinking activate, but yield. Or they didn't yield. They didn't believe it or they didn't yield to it. They didn't let it happen. They start feeling something. And I'm, none of that weird stuff going on with me. So I want to talk about a little bit tonight about the manifestations of the Spirit in Scripture. The manifestations of the Spirit in Scripture. Let's go to Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in with one accord in one place. And suddenly, ever say suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Pretty dramatic. I like this. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. Now, I know we have these images and these pictures of this little tiny flame sitting on top of their head, you know. But I, I, like, I, I like what I've heard some other, uh, I think it was Mike Bickle said, but uh, I like something that these, uh, I don't know if it was Mike Bickle, it was one, but, but I, they, they, they said, you know, we have this image of this little thing. He said, I had an image of their bodies consumed with fire. And when it's just a little tiny fire, they were consumed with fire. I mean, go, go look at every strain. Now, I remember the first, uh, this young man came to our, our youth group. It was back in 1987, 1988, sorry, 1988. And we had a little youth group, and it was like five kids, average five. You know, in fact, I remember the first time I had nine people, and I got nervous because there was such a big crowd. <laughs> and uh, if I can get a picture of that. Um, and uh, anyways, so he came, and he was from a Presbyterian church, but he had started reading the book of Acts. And he and his friend Dirk started really believing for, 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 for this thing. So they heard about, I don't know how they heard about me, but they heard about me. And, um, oh, I know how they heard about me because I started a Bible club on my college campus. And I handed out little flyers. They were terrible designs. I mean, it was, it was, it was horrible looking. But I, I did a, a little flyer. And, uh, uh, I, 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 and this guy, Dirk, showed up. And he was just like, he told me that he and his friend are so hungry for God. And I said, well, I prayed for him. The power of God touched him. I said, well, come on out to my, our, our, our Friday night meeting. And so he came out. But that particular Friday night, we had a guest minister in the church. So we all joined the main service. So I, I head out to the lobby. And this, this, his, this guy, Dirk, chases me. And he brings his friend, Jeff Kazulis. And Jeff comes out. 
And he says, tell me about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I was like, okay. okay. And I started talking. He said, how do you receive it? I said, well, how did you get saved? I said, you just simply ask God. And he gave it to you right then, right? I said, same thing with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he sits there and goes, Jesus, baptize me the Holy Ghost right now. I was like, man, this guy's serious. We were right in the lobby. It's like going to block everybody. I said, well, come over here. And uh, we actually, I brought him over or kind of around a corner somewhere. And I walked him through it again. And I just, I went and prayed for him. And I, I, as soon as I started praying for him, I mean, within seconds, he started speaking in tongues like a freight train. I mean, he's like, and then boom, he got slain in the Holy Ghost. We're going we're gonna to see this in a moment. And he fell into the power of the Holy Spirit. Whoa, this was cool. And he, and, and he was down there for about 15 minutes speaking in tongues to his friend, friend Dirk. Because I, I told Dirk, just stand behind him. Dirk didn't know what to do. I said, stick your hands out. He's like, why? You'll find out. <laughs> Boom, he fell down. So he's down to like 15 minutes. Dirk's like, ooh. When Jeff got up, Jeff, when Jeff got up, he looked at me and he said, were there flames on my head? <laughs> so, that, so that Dirk said, I want it. I said, all right, we'll pray for you. He, he got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. So these signs, supernatural manifestations, speaking in tongues, falling under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Falling. There's instances throughout Scripture of falling under the power. In fact, let's go to Revelation chapter 1, verse 17. Revelation chapter 1, verse 17. Falling under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and I am the last. There's many, script, many examples in Scripture where people fell under the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, people are funny. When they want to resist the working of God, they come up with a lot of really lame excuses. Well, in the Bible, when they fell back, it was judgment. When they fell forward, it was God. Really? Had this big guy at the I-55 revival, that two-and-a-half-year revival we did, or 25-month revival, big, big guy. And every time he got touched by the Holy Spirit, he didn't fall back, and he didn't actually fall forward. He just, boom, dropped right on his knees. He's a big guy. Okay? Knees are about up here. The perfect landing place for his knees was my toes. <laughs> I got slammed more times on my toes and prayed for him. He goes, he goes boom. Goes, oh, thank you, Jesus. In Ezekiel, in fact, Ezekiel, let's go to Ezekiel 128. There's actually multiple examples, four examples in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 128. Like the appearance, Ezekiel was like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day. He was, Ezekiel was having a vision. So is the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard a voice of one speaking. We see four times uh, Ezekiel falling under the power of the presence of God. I'm going to go through a list of these. I don't want to get to something. Drunk in the spirit. I always say whatever the enemy offers, it's a substitute for what God really does. Drunk. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you are like, what in the world are you talking about? I used to be drunk on wine. I used to be drunk on Mickey's Big Mouths, but <laughs> wine and beer and all kinds of hard liquor. But then I got touched May 2nd, 1986 by the power of the Holy Ghost. And I found out what a good drunk is. So what's the difference between a worldly drunk and a good drunk? The hangovers are awesome. Now, I really do believe that, that the enemy offers those things as a substitute for the moving of the Spirit of God. Drunk in the Spirit. We all, we all, we all know from a, uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, but... It said, but listen to what it says, uh, drunk in the spirit. And those who were filled with the Holy Spirit appeared in Acts, appeared to be, oh, you, know, you, you can keep that one up there. They appeared to be drunk. They appeared to be drunk. And then so much so, Peter said, these are not drunk as you suppose. 
When was the last time you walked out of church and people thought you were drunk? Boy, it's quiet tonight. Some of you like last week. <laughs> they were drunk in the spirit. Okay, let's go back to, uh, is that the Ephesians? Oh, Ephesians chapter 5. Sorry, Ephesians chapter 5, verse, uh, what is it, about 14, 13, 14, 17. Let's just jump in there. Ephesians chapter 5. I'm just doing this all, okay? Therefore, do not be unwise. Yeah, this is right because it's verse 18. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. What is the will of the Lord? <laughs> do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. In other words, don't be drunk with wine, but the will of the Lord is be drunk in the Holy Ghost. All right. In fact, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 13. A scripture you probably never thought about in this. Look what Paul's saying. And if we are besides ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. So in comparison, there's sometimes we look like we got it all, and sometimes it looks like we're besides ourselves. But we're besides ourselves, it's for God. <laughs> That's a cool one. <laughs> Never thought of that one. Uh, uh. Okay, laughter. <laughs> laughter. Or as, as Rodney and Basil would say, ho, ho, ho. Ha, ha, ha. Okay. Okay. Laughter that is sometimes uncontrollable and lasts for hours is a manifestation of the joy of the Lord. This is not dependent upon personality type. <laughs> Because there's some people that are just gigglers. Okay, they laugh at everything. They think everything's funny and they're funny. Great people. But it's really hilarious when you get the most stiff, stalwart people. Proper. And they get so hit with the power of the Holy Ghost that they get uncontrollable laughter. Now, I know sometimes you're like, oh, that's just so weird. Wonderful. You know, we have no problem with the world being weird, but we have really problem with church being weird. I mean, some of the very people that call us being weird will go to these, like, really weird parties. You know, they'll go to football games and act really weird. They'll get drunk and act really weird. They go to church like, well, that's not supposed to be this way. All right. Remember, it's all a substitute. Laughter. The kingdom is joy in the spirit. Let's go to Romans 14, verse 17. Romans 14, verse 17. I'm throwing these. Griselda's doing a great job back there. i just firing these things at her. Romans 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Let's go to Psalm 126, verse 2 and 3. Psalm 126, verse 2 and 3. Then our mouth was filled with, and our tongue with, then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things among them. When? When your mouth is filled with laughter and your tongue is filled with singing. Huh? The world is not going to get excited about Christianity when you're a bunch of boring, depressed. Huh? You say, why? Well, I haven't experienced this. These signs will follow them that believe. Now, another manifestation, trembling. Trembling. This was common throughout history. Trembling. The fear of God fell on the people near Daniel as he received a vision. Let's go to Daniel chapter 10, verse 7. Daniel chapter 10, verse 7. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great terror fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. There was such an intensity to the presence of God that they actually trembled. They actually trembled with fear. We see that throughout Scripture. In fact, Jeremiah, Jeremiah, uh, I don't think I have it, that one down here. But in Jeremiah, Jeremiah says, he says, all my, oh, actually, well, that's, oh, that's shaking too. All my bones shake. He said, I'm like a drunken man and a man whom wine has overcome because of the Lord and his words of holiness. 
that there was literally a trembling and a shaking that took place. We see that throughout Scripture. You know, how many ever heard of the Quakers? You know why they're called the Quakers? Because they quaked. No, literally, that's why they're called the Quakers. Okay, now we just see them as a bunch of people that, you know, don't believe in technology. But they were people that literally quaked. They were so, in fact, they had a great influence upon America and the writing of the Constitution, by the way. In fact, they're the ones that insisted and put in the uh, First Amendment and the protections of religious freedom was the Quakers. They were, had great influence, uh, but they're mainly based out of the Pennsylvania area. But literally, they would literally have such, and this went on for long, hundreds of years, they would have such encounters with God that their body would literally shake and quake. They called them Quakers. Then there was another group in Kentucky called the Shakers. So we had the Shakers and the Quakers. <laughs> shaking. Some shaking slightly and some violently. In Charles Finney's meetings, one of the great American revivalists from the 1800s, he would be preaching, and while he was preaching, the anointing of God would hit people so strong, sometimes conviction so strong, and, and the women back then, they had, you know, they didn't cut their hair, they had long hair, and they would put it in these long braids like a horse's tail, you know, the big long braids, and they would jerk and, and shake so violently whew, that they said literally their hair would shoot in the air and whip like a horse's whip. Whew, can you imagine? Man, and you thought the person next to you was fidgety. Can you imagine? So, I mean, what? Wow. That kid's getting, that kid's mess, you know, getting out of hand here. The woman just goes, wow. Okay. Sometimes even building shook. Sometimes even the ground shook. A friend of mine was preaching in New Zealand when all of a sudden he was, he was preaching about the manifestations of God and he was literally talking about shaking and that sometimes God will even shake, it, shake the ground. And as soon as he said it, sometimes God will even shake the ground, all of a sudden, <laughs> the whole ground shook. They, they were sure it's New Zealand. They have a lot of earthquakes. They were sure it was an earthquake, but there was nobody, no seismic register or anything, but the entire building shook. Oh, Y'all looking at me strange. That's all right. That's all right. Well, I could just bring him here and let him tell you the truth. Now, an, another manifestation, this one I wish some people would have received, speechless. <laughs> For some reason, I looked at Miss Tammy and she was like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm only kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> speechless, she's speechless. I've experienced this. I have experienced this on multiple occasions where I literally couldn't speak. I was in a service uh, with Dr. Moore Cirillo back in the late 1980s. When the Spirit of God, he told us, Dr. Shula had us turn to one another and pray for one another. And just really, uh, just, and, and he said, pray for them like you've never prayed for any before. And I, as we were I was just praying for them, I looked up and I saw, literally, I just saw into the heavens. I saw into the throne of God for about two seconds. It's like the heavens split open and I could see the throne of God. I was so overwhelmed, I just fell backwards, just collapsed. And I fell backwards. I couldn't, I couldn't get up for 90 minutes. I couldn't speak for three hours, I was so overwhelmed, I could not speak. Oh, God, let us have encounters with him like that. Come on, amen? Just can't speak. Speechless. In fact, <coughs> we see multiple scriptures of that, multiple times where they encountered God in such a way in their speeches. Let's go to Daniel chapter 10, verse 15 for a moment. Daniel chapter 10, verse 15. And when, I, when he had spoken such words to me, I turned my face towards the ground and became speechless. And became speechless. I always like when people say, I'm just speechless. I'm, I'm just speechless. I am so speechless right now. No, you're not. <laughs> Weeping. Many have tears of joy. Or the tenderness of feeling loved by God, or love for God, or weep in repentance or mourning over sin or spiritual dullness. And I have experienced all of that. 
I, uh, oh, yeah, we just, we're weeping. I, I've, I've, I've encountered many times in prayer just the travailing, and you just begin to weep over a generation. I mean, weep and weep and weep. And there's a breakthrough that takes place in that. But I've also so many times just wept over just being loved by God. Ah, oh, there's a song that it's so personal to me, uh, but it's by a guy by the name of Terry Clark in the 1980s called I Am Yours. And it is like, it's, it's, you know, people say, we, that, you know, they're playing our song. That's, that's our song. I am yours. Ugh. I have spent more, literally hours, I have spent more hours weeping before the presence of God over that. There's just, it's just such a love song between me and him. And I would just, just, I mean, just weep and weep and weep. In fact, some of you that have been in the church for a while, you've seen a few times on a Sunday morning. I remember that one time on a Sunday morning. I didn't get to preach because I just spent most of the time on the, on the altar just weeping. Glory to God. Y'all looking at me strange. That's all right. I don't mind. Because I love weeping. Sometimes weeping suddenly turns to laughter. That's, I exp- that's cool. I, I just read that note right there, but that really is true. Because I had, I had that the very first time. I experienced both of those in a huge way. I was at a youth camp. And I was, it was my, I was only seven weeks old in the Lord. And I, had, I won't tell you the whole story. I've shared it before. But I, when I got to the altar to pray for the young people that just got saved, I had poured out myself so much already. And when I got there, I just began to be showered by the love of God. It was so overwhelming. The feeling was so strong. And I just wept and wept and wept for a long time. And then the weeping turned into laughter. And that was the first time I had holy laughter for like two hours. I was so drunk in the spirit. My kids had to carry me back to our cabin. Uh, it was so awesome. These things are not supposed to be rare. They're supposed to be a normal experience of the Christian life. Boy, it's quiet. All right. Trances. Caught away into a trance. In fact, let's go to um, Acts chapter 10, verse 10. Acts chapter 10, verse 10. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. He fell into a trance, and that's, God spoke to him there. But it is very often through revival history that trances would happen. People would literally, and get ready, I'm telling you, you're going to have times and experiences where people will literally be out, they'll be gone, they will, they, you will not even know, they will not even know where they are, and they'll be in these trances, and sometimes it'll go on for days. I was in a, uh, at a more solo conference, the first time I've ever experienced this. And I'm sharing these things because I've experienced almost all of them. We were in a hotel room, and uh, we, would, we would go, a group of us, young adults, we were just so hungry for God, and God was moving so powerfully. And after the services, we'd go up to the hotel room and just pray for hours, you know, into the middle of the night. And it was a very unusual meeting. It was May of 1998, or 1988, excuse me, May of 1988. It was a very unusual meeting. It was such a presence of God. And what started happening is different people, while we were praying, they would just literally just feel like they got caught away in the, into the heavens. And it happened to me several times. And it would go on uh, about an hour. And literally, I couldn't move. I couldn't speak. I couldn't open my eyes. I was just gone. You would just be gone. But you didn't think you were, it was an hour. You would like just a few moments, and you're so caught up in this presence of God. And then you'd open your eyes back up, and they're like, whoa, where have you been? What do you mean? It's, you, you've been that way for an hour. What? Just frozen solid. Just for an hour. Don't look at me straight. All right. This is so cool. Go into trances. Why? Because God, God does stuff. And I think sometimes he just needs to shut us up long enough to speak to us. You know, i got to put him out. You know. Now, this is a strange one, but it does happen. Uh, I like the phraseology here. Pockets of power. Pockets of power. Where there's particular spots that seem to have an exceptionally powerful manifestation of the Spirit of God. It's odd. I don't understand it, but it happens. I've heard many, many testimonies of it. We've seen it in our meetings, but also it, it's throughout Scripture. The report of small pockets of heightened activity of the Spirit is common in times of revival. When people walk into a specific area like this, they experience the Spirit's presence in an intensified way. They may fall, laugh, shake, cry, or receive a healing. 
An example of this dynam dynamic occurred when Saul and his men went near a group of prophets. That's in first Sam in first Samuel chapter 19. And when they came near the prophets, the spirit came on Saul's men. And they also prophesied. Let's go to let, let, let's look at this. Uh, 19 1 Samuel 19, 20, and 21. 1 Samuel 19, 20, and 21. This is cool. That there, around this prophet was this pocket of power. Then Saul sent messengers. Uh, that's, is that 1 Samuel? Yeah. Messengers to David. And when they saw the group of prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as leader over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. They simply got around those that were operating in the spirit of prophecy, and they started prophesying. They got pockets of power. I remember the first time I really started experiencing this is when Dr. Morsullo would, at, at the end of his conferences, every, the last service, he would always do an anointing service. And when I first started with him, he would have everybody line up and he'd, shoot, they'd clear out the ballroom and they'd do these massive lines and he'd walk down and line them up. But after a while, that, that became more difficult for him. So he started having people pass through and pass by him. So I remember coming through the line, and, and, and as you passed by, he anointed you with oil. But I, you didn't even get to him. You were like quite a ways away from him. And as you got closer, you could literally feel like, like the anointing running like oil, like hot oil. And it kept getting higher. And, it was just like, and, and he'd be like, you know, 20 feet away, and you're like, whoa. And it's just radiating. There's just this up front, there was just this pocket of power. At, the, uh, at IHOP back in 2009 when they had the, uh, the awakening, the student awakening there, which was such an amazing thing to just happen, it just, uh, the, the breakthrough that, that took place. They, they, in, the, in the altar, in the sanctuary, there was a particular part side of the altar, just a particular area, maybe about, you know, 20 feet by 20 feet. They said almost, probably 90% of all the healings took place in that pocket. The one year, they were, they were meeting together, I think, five nights, four nights a week for a year. And all, like nearly 90% of all the healings took place in that one pocket. Why? I don't know. It's a sign to make you wonder. Huh? But can you imagine people sit back and say, well, I, I, don't, I don't think I need to go up there to get my healed. If the Lord wants me healed, he'll just heal me back here. Well, he might, but, 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 but you need to humble yourself a little bit. <laughs> Why are we so afraid of the supernatural? Why are we so freaked out about it by in church? Why have churches, spirit-filled, indoctrined churches, have spent so much time minimizing the, the expression of it, especially on Sunday morning? You cannot separate Jesus' teaching ministry from his miracle ministry, and yet we have done it in our day. We constantly do it. Maybe that's why we're not changing America. Pockets of power. Woo, glory to God. This one, I haven't, well, I was going to say I haven't experienced this one, but actually I have. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you another one. Wow. Traveling by the Spirit. Now, I wish I had that more often because these airline flights are long. <laughs> Lord Jesus. Some, like Philip, have been physically taken. I have not been physically taken, but, but in the Spirit, translated in the Spirit. I've had a few times where I've, in times of seasons of prayer, where I literally knew, I literally went somewhere. I went somewhere else. One time, I was, I was in prayer with uh, uh, Brent. You all heard me, you've been around here, heard me talk about Brent a lot. But Brent, and we were in this time of prayer in, in, in this extra room, my office down in in my house in, in California. And when all of a sudden we were both simultaneously, it was like we were just shot straight up. I mean, high in the atmosphere. And it was a realm where I could, I could see, because of that, I could like see other believers, not very many of them, but pockets of two or three here, they're all over the globe. I could see them. And it was like we could, it was like we could, have, it was like, a, like this distance, and yet they were, you know, 5,000 miles away. And it's like we could communicate. And, and all of a sudden, it was like, Lord, it was the Lord showing me, this is a realm. I had heard it, testimonies through times of revival where people would literally have, in different parts of the world, would literally have conversations with each other. They would literally be able to communicate with each other. That this, y'all looking at me really strange, okay? And it literally, literally happened. 
I mean, what do you think actually happens? And you've heard the testimonies where someone was interceding, you know, in America, and then a missionary comes and visits their home or visits their church and shares a story how about they were going through the bush in Africa and that these, uh, the, these um, thieves came to jump out to rob them and, kill, you know, and injure them or maybe kill them, and then all of a sudden fear struck them and they took off running. And then this little lady stands up and says, I, w- I saw that. I was praying for you. And I was standing there, and I was standing on the, uh, along the side of the, of the road, and I saw them coming, and I prayed, and I saw that exact thing happen. See, some people say, well, maybe it was just a vision, but I believe sometimes they were actually translated there literally. They were literally there. So I'm, I'm up in the spirit room, and I'm, I'm, I'm like, man, and I'm looking down, and there's like a, a, like a black cloud and I saw most other Christians, and they were underneath the black cloud. I could clearly see them, but I knew they couldn't see up through it. And the Lord was really showing me that most Christians have no idea of this realm of the Spirit that's even possible. But I believe in the end times that we're going to have a whole generation of people that understand how to walk in the Spirit as He is in the Spirit. Just like Jesus said in John chapter uh, 3, in verse 12 and 13. John chapter 3. In fact, let's go to John chapter 3, verse 12 and 13. He said, if, if I've told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? He said, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is, everybody say is, who is in heaven. We know that Ezekiel was translated, not only was he translated in the, and caught away in the spirit and put on the valley of dry bones, but many scholars believe he was literally translated from his day into the 1940s early 1940s into Nazi Germany and literally saw the actual valleys filled with the dry bones. How do you get dry bones? You got to incinerate the bodies with the bodies that were incinerated at Auschwitz and they would build big, these big, they had these huge valleys because it was millions of people that got killed and they were filled with a valley of dry bones. And it was literally taken there. Woo. Traveling by the Spirit. Very cool one. Let's go to Acts chapter 8, verse 39 and 40. Let's look at that for a moment. Acts chapter 8, verse, isn't it amazing? It's all over Scripture, guys. It's all, all these things. Now, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch, he baptized the eunuch, the eunuch saw him no more, and he went his way rejoicing. Philip was translated. Gone. Very cool. Very cool. Fire. I'm going to say fire. The believers in the upper room saw fire. Resting on each person. God's fire fell from heaven in the Old Testament multiple times. Not just spiritual fire, but literal fire. Heard the stories. Heard the stories many times of revival where fire departments would be called because pastor buyers saw the building on fire. So they called it a fire department, and it was not a literal fire. It was the fire of the Holy Ghost. Sometimes you feel fire. Am I talking to you? Some of you know what I'm talking about. Like, Whoa, my, my hand's on fire. It's not, this girl's on fire. No, no, not that one. I don't know why that popped in my head. Fire. Acts chapter 2, verse 19. Let's look at this. Acts chapter 2, verse 19. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Ah, So all the people that like vaping can say it's in the Bible. (laughs) no don't go there but not only that there are many manifestations specific manifestations that are not recorded in scripture and that's where people get hung up and say well I I don't see that in the Bible so it just must not be for today and that's just that's so poor biblical interpretation and here's why If if the biblical rule is that if it's not literally in Scripture, it's not valid, then most of the songs we sing in church are not valid because they're not literally in Scripture. Huh? It's, if it's a principle, it's a principle. It's a principle of biblical interpretation. Then it's a principle of biblical inter- interpretation, and it applies across the board. 
So if you don't have that, that's where people say, well, I just don't see that gold dust specifically in the Bible. No, it, it, it falls under the umbrella. The Scriptures give us the boundaries with within God moves. But there's certain things we look for to determine, is this of God or is this not of God? There are many things. In fact, Scripture says in John 21, verse 25, let's put this up there, because this one Scripture settles it all. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. He didn't say there were the things he, it wasn't talking about the teachings he taught. He was talking, this was specifically talking about the miracles he did. There were many more things he did. And he said, I would suppose maybe all the books, of course, back then, it's not as many books as we have today, but all the books of the world, it would take all them just to be, to be filled, just to write everything that he did. So when God clearly states out in John that this is not an all-inclusive this is simply a sampling, a tiny sampling of what he did. Then how is it that we can stand up and say, well, it's not literally in the Bible, therefore, you know, God can't do it that way. <laughs> the, the arrogance and the presumptuousness of our part, and that is just doubt and unbelief that is trying to force us into not accepting it and not believing for it. I was watching some old A.A. A. Allen Videos. For those of you that don't know A.A. Allen, God used him tremendously in, in, the great, in the 50s and early 60s or the 50, 40s and 50s, great healing tent. And these guys were crazy. I mean, they would, just, they would preach, and then he would just have people come on up one by one with a little note with their problem. And he didn't pre-pray. They, they just prayed from right there to believe God. I mean, I've seen some crazy miracles. People popping out of wheelchairs, kids who've never walked in their life popping up and start walking. I mean, just some, I mean, really phenomenal stuff right there, right in front of your eyes. I've watched several of these videos. They're like, this is so cool. And it's such a simple prayer. He just puts his hand, he prays for maybe 20 seconds, and then steps back, and boom, God heals him. It's like, whoa. But so many, there were so many critics. Oh, it's too dramatic. It's too dynamic. It's too, too this. It's too that. Who cares? They got healed. Listen, in Acts, uh, in Acts chapter 2, verse, let's begin with verse 11. In Acts chapter 2, verse 11, I want you to see the common reaction. The common reaction. Okay, so they were all filled, right? They got filled with tongues. They were speaking in other tongues. And uh, Cretans and Arabs were, uh, we hear them speaking in our own tongue, the wonderful works of God. Keep going. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocking said they are full of new wine. So some people are like rejoicing because God's moving. Wow, this is, we're hearing the praises of God. This has got to be a sign. This has got to be from God. At the same time, there's other people right there mocking the very thing that's going on. So don't get surprised and don't get defensive when people mock the working of the Spirit. It's normal. If it happened on the day of Pentecost, which was slightly dramatic, okay, I think it's going to happen in our church days. Amen? All right. Joel spoke of a future empowering of the Spirit in Joel chapter 2, verse 28, and, and afterwards. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and young men shall see visions. We all know this verse, most of us here, very, very well. But he's saying this is going to happen. It's going to increase in the last days. There is going to be a dramatic increase of the supernatural in the end times. Hallelujah. There have been so many manifestations that have been commonly reported throughout history. But I want to deal with a couple things here in the last few minutes. Are you all with me? Is this good? You're getting some? All right. Number one, I want to deal with, uh, first off, I want to deal with the purpose of the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. The purpose. Purposes of the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Number one, the, the fruit of manifestation is seen in the lives of believers. The purpose of the manifestation. In fact, I, I, there's one thing that I look for, and this may come up again in a moment, but there's one thing that I really look for when the manifestations come. I look for, does it stir up hunger? Remember what we talked about, that God responds to hunger? Does it stir up hunger? When they have that manifestation, does it stir up them up to want to go after God more, to love God more, to, to live for God more? It doesn't mean they're going to be perfect. We're going to deal with that in a moment. But I want it, the, there's a fruit of manifestation there, is there a greater intimacy with God? 
Uh, is there an impartation of love and peace and joy or even the fear of God? Is there freedom from bondage, from fear, from anger, from bitterness, from pain, from lust? Are they physically healed? You know, what, 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 what are these things? Is what, do you see something happening in their life that lines up with what Jesus does? With lines up with what his will has done, why the purpose he came, and lines up with what he accomplished in people's lives. Uh, yes, if it stirs up hunger, if it stirs up a passion for God, this is good. Number two, this is huge, and I find this to be true. First off, it, what is the fruit of the manifestation? The purposes of the manifestation, the fruit of the manifestation is this transformation. Something takes place in life. does not mean they're going to be perfect. doesn't mean they're never going to sin. We see a lot of people in Scripture that had tremendous, incredible encounters with God and the Spirit of God that still afterwards failed mightily. Okay? So that idea, well, if that was really, I saw them get slain in the Spirit and shake for 20 minutes, and then three weeks later I heard them cussing in the parking lot. That must not have been of God. How dumb can you be and still breathe? Uh, you know, it's interesting. We, we put the people who, who are negative on manifestations put a requirement on the evidence of manifestations higher than the Word of God. Well, oh, they heard a, they, uh, they heard a, good, a good scripture, and, and, and we're a part of a great Bible study, and they really seemed to get it. Oh, but three weeks later, I saw them cussing. Well, the Lord's working on them. But if they get slain in the spirit and they're shaking, well, it must not have been of God. Well, maybe the preaching must not have been of God. See, we hold a different standard. Why? Because we're trying to disprove it. We're trying to say it's not, it's not, it's not real. So in order to do, so 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 we put a, such a higher standard that if it was really a supernatural manifestation of God, then all of a sudden everything in their life must have changed. No, nope, it didn't. All right, number two, you all ready for this? Enlarge the spiritual capacity. This is something the supernatural manifestations do. When you have them, it enlarges your spiritual capacity. It makes your spirit bigger. It makes your capacity to receive more. All right. Has anybody ever noticed that when you first started, in, in, those of you that have experienced the movement in the Spirit of God, when it first started getting around it, like the slightest little just of God just, just blew you away? Now it's got to be, you know, it's got to be pretty hard, big. Come on, right. Your, your capacity, but also your ability to receive more. It opens you up. It, it, I, I, I say it this way, that these encounters that come actually give people the ability, and that's why I love going to meetings where I travel, because people come into these encounters that they've never had with God before, and what happens is it's like kicking a new door open so they can go farther and they can go deeper. Lord, someone say, Lord, expand my capacity. Are you guys with uh, I'm going to come in for a landing here in a minute. Okay? Number three, manifestations as a sign. The purpose of manifestation, one of the reasons is, to, is, is, is as a sign. These signs shall follow them that believe. And, the, and they went everywhere preaching the word, and the Lord co confirming his word with the signs accompanying. That God will back up his word with supernatural signs. Woo. I remember when I stood up. And I've shared the story before, but that's okay. You guys are church, so you get to hear them over and over again. That's the one thing about itinerary. It's great. Every place I go, it's new stories. But, but we were at the I-55 revival about three weeks into the revival in 2001. And the Lord spoke to me and said, prophesy. I'm going to open up the heavens and pour out. Pour. And, uh, uh, and I'm going to pour out a flood. And I'm thinking just in the spirit. Just a flood. I'm going to open the heavens, pour out, and it's going to, it, a flood. I said, all right, look. So then I was back at the pastor's house. That's where I was staying. And it was about 2 o'clock in the morning. And there, at 2 o'clock in the morning, I was getting ready to go to bed. And I flipped on the weather channel, as is my habit. And I flipped on the weather channel and saw the forecast. And there was not a storm within 1,000 miles from us. It was one of those seasons. Everything was dry. Nothing even close. Zero percent chance of rain. I go to bed at 2 o'clock. At 4 o'clock in the morning, I'm woke up by the sound of pouring rain against the window. I mean, pouring rain. And I was like, oh, wow, it's pouring rain. Oh, okay. So I just lay back down, and it's just loud for the next two hours. Finally, at 6 o'clock, I get up. Going, Man, it's so, and it hit me. Wait a minute. There was zero chance of rain, and it's still raining. So I got up. I turned on the weather channel, and I see the radar. And it is a perfectly round thunderstorm. 
sitting right on top of where we're at, Crystal Springs, Mississippi. 30 miles in north, no rain. 30 miles in south, east, west, no rain at all. Just sat there for eight hours and rained 11 inches. And there were floods everywhere. But right before I went to bed, the Lord spoke to me, and he said, turn to Psalm 138, or 130, uh, 133. I think, oh, let me go there. It was 133, verse 8, I think it is. I want you guys to see this because I just got, it like really fried me. And then we're going to go to the Amplified on that. No, 119.38, that's what it is. 119.38, put that up there. Psalm 119, verse 38, that was what it was. Establish your word to your servant who is devoted to fearing you. Now put up, put up the Amplified, because he had me read it in the Amplified, and he said, pray this. Establish your word and confirm your promise to your servant, which is for those who reverently fear and devoutly worship you. Establish your word and confirm your promise. And I told the Lord, hey, he started having me pray that. I said, Lord, I don't need you to confirm the word. I already believe it's true. He said, pray it. So I can establish your word, confirm your promise. Establish your word, confirm your promise. Now I had prophesied earlier that night that the heavens were going to open and a flood was going to come out. And then within a couple hours, a thunders. Now I know some of you may be looking at saying, now do you think you prayed that into existence? Yes. Yes. Yes, of course I do. Not because I'm anything super special. He's the one that told me to pray it. Then I prayed it, and then he did it. And trust me, he gets all the glory. <laughs> but it was a sign. It was one of the signs that happened in the I-55 revival. Another sign that happened. Oh, glory to God. We had just started the revival, and we, we did a couple days, and we're going to come back and continue it. And uh, the board of de demons, I mean deacons, uh, the board, board uh, he had 16 members in his board. That was just suicide. But he had 16 members in his board. And 12 of them, many of them were already, normally already with him, always with him. They said, we, we don't think we're ready for revival. We, we, we enjoyed the meetings. They're powerful. We don't think we're ready for revival. And I was so, the pastor called me up. He was canceling the meeting. And I went in, I said, I almost went off on him. I said, no. I said, what do you mean? You've never seen an outpouring like this. How could you? But I didn't say it. I held my tongue. That was the grace of God. And I went into my bedroom to pray. And I said, I, as soon as I walked, I said, let me call you back. Let me go pray. I walked to my bedroom and I said, God, what's going on? And the Lord spoke to me and immediately. He said, he said, they say they have a check in their spirit, but the reality is they're fearful about the money. That's what he told me. He said, now you tell the pastor to go in. He had a board meeting, emergency board meeting that night. He said, you tell him to go back in that meeting to so sit quiet, not say a word. He said, 25 minutes into the conversation, they'll first start out by saying how they feel, a check in their spirit. He said, 25 minutes into the conversation, the truth will come out. And he will know exactly, and, and, he, and they will tell the truth that it's all about the money. The pastor called me up the next day. He said, Steve, I told, I told him that, I called him on the phone. I said, here's what's going to happen. He went into the board meeting, kept his mouth shut. He said, he was, and this guy is a guy who will hold you to your prophetic word. Okay, he, he's not playing games. So he was timing it. No, you've met Pastor Dale. He'll do that. He'll, he was timing it. The guy's, you know, a scholarly guy. And so he's a, he said exactly at 25 minutes, he said the conversation suddenly turned, and they admitted it was all about the money. But God had already told me what to do. He said they were afraid that I was going to receive all the money through the offerings. But God had told me, even though we we're doing three days of meetings, five meetings a week in three days, he said only receive one offering a week for your ministry. He said everything else goes to the church. So the pastor said, well, when they brought up the money, he said, well, by the way, Brother Steve called me this morning and told me this is what God told him to do. And now they realized they were going to get most of the offerings. They were like, oh, okay, that'll work. But pastor was praying, God, you got to confirm this, you got to convert this. So we go back the next Wednesday, and the Spirit of God was so strong, and the worship and the anointing, I, I never even got to preach. I mean, I'm praying, and power of God's falling, and the pastor was excited. He was like, this is the confirmation that this is right. So we get back to his house, and we're eating, and we get a phone call from this group of 12 leaders that were against it. They all had their little private meeting in the parking lot after service. And they said, Pastor, you got to get down here. They said, what is it? You've got to come see. They said it was a, a, a crystal clear night, not a cloud in the sky, with a gentle breeze blowing. 
And he said, there was a bright white cloud that formed just over top the sanctuary. And it, it was, he said, and it lowered down that you could have stood on the roof and put your hand into it. And it sat there. And then when we showed, by the time we got there, right before we showed up, it moved off. And we saw the remnants of it float off, but, but it, was, it had moved off. And most of them had, had left when it started to move off. They went ahead and left. And when they got home, many of them, their family members started freaking out. Remember, these are the guys who were against it. They started freaking out saying, what's all over your body? Their bodies were covered with gold dust. <laughs> Woo, glory to God. God said, pull them in there. And despite that, despite that, within two months, half his staff had resigned, half his board had quit, and half his church had left. But now, God took this little dinky church in Crystal Springs, Mississippi, that was a little country church, and they have written curriculum and developed things, and they have favor with the largest network of home churches throughout all of China that is using their material to train their leaders. Oh, my goodness. Let me get to... Oh, okay. Let me, let me, let me hit this. Jonah, I, I got too much to get into. <clears throat> Exposing false equations about the manifestations. False equation one. If a manifestation is genuine, it will always bring lasting fruit and change. Nope. Not always. Scripture has many examples of people who stumble after encountering God in a powerful way. Not always. Number two. If you are sensitive to the Spirit, you will be touched in ways others, in the ways that others are. Not always. Some people may get touched a certain way, and other people get touched in a completely different way. One of the things that I find is, 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 is saddening is sometimes people, they get so hung up and struggle. And it's like, it's nothing wrong with asking God, but, but they, they rate their spirituality based upon how somebody else received. No, I just, God, give me everything you got for me. I want it all. You know, but it doesn't have to look just like them. I haven't had certain encounters the way certain people have. I've, I've had amazing encounters for my life. But mine are unique. Some of mine are very unique and distinct. You're not, you know, you don't have to have encounters like me. I mean, yes, some people quench the spirit because of being closed with unbelief and fear and pride. It is also true that many with fear, pride, and unbelief also encounter the spirit in powerful ways. False uh, equation number three. If the spirit touches you, then you will not have any control over your actions. That's more, much more rare than you would realize. The Bible says the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. I had no control. We had, a, we had a, a guy that was in the church for a little while, and he would just take off running and run over people and run up on the stage and run all over the place. I can't control it. I can't control it. It's like, no, dude, you totally, you almost knocked over this old lady. Yeah, you could totally control it. That's just an excuse for an unwillingness to be disciplined, and you just want to do what you want to do. Now, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Now, there are times. There are times, but it's not, it's not, it's not the rule. It's more the exception. God wor works within the context of human responses. In other words, if a person, if the person continues to yield, uh, more will usually happen. So it's more of a, not, I, not that I can't control it, but I'm yielding more. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm yielding more. False equation number four. And I, I've got so much more I want to get into, but I'm just going to, I have to come in for a landing. If I was more committed to Jesus, I would receive more manifestations. Receiving manifestations of the Spirit is not a sign of commitment or spiritual maturity. I want you to hear me on this. The manifestations of the Spirit are freely received by faith, not by earning them. See, that's where a lot of people, well, if I was just more spiritual, I would have more. It's received by faith. That's why so often it's young Christians 
even sometimes struggling, but they're early, you know, but they're just fresh in this thing. And they get so many encounters with God. And why people who've been in church forever and ever and ever, they seem to not because they're trying to earn it. Well, I've, Lord, I've been faithful. They say, that, Lord, I've prayed. Lord, I've fasted. Lord, I've given my time. Why haven't I had that? Because it was never about earning it. It was about simply receiving it by faith. Something by faith. Assumption number five. This is important. False equation number five. If you do not fall down, then you are unspiritual or resisting the spirit. No. Some of the most powerful touches I've had, I stood up. Huh? Right? You don't need to help anybody fall down. Receive. <laughs> you know? Now, there are times, many times I find people that are resisting that, that you can feel it when you're praying for them and the Spirit of God's touching them and they're just, oh, I don't want to fall, I don't want to fall, I don't want to fall. They're, they're so hung up on that that they actually are resisting what God's doing in them. They're so worried about falling. You know, no, oh, no, no, just, just, just relax and rest and receive. These signs shall follow them who believe. Amen.